thing is Ephesians 3, think going along with our thought of how the church and it's founded upon God and the glory of God and, and rejoicing in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 19, just the end of this chapter where Paul points out how great the work of God is in Christ. Ephesians 3, 19, and what is, so he's praying that God's people would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe, and this, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, eternity. And hath put all things under his feet. And gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The churches of Christ. Wow, what a perspective. And what a foundation that this Jesus, uh, what does it say? Set at the right hand of God, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named. He gave him to be the head over the church. God, thank you for this time together in worship. Again, it's, it's just a wonderful opportunity every Lord's Day. Every Lord's Day. It's snow in the winter gets in the way, and we're thankful that it never hinders our walk with you, and it doesn't hinder your work in our lives. But we're also thankful that we do get together, even in the winter. The, the weather cooperates, and we're able to be here. Because, Lord, this is what you've given to your church. You've given us this opportunity to worship together in spirit and in truth. To be able to, two or three meeting together in your presence as you're in our midst and you do your work in our lives. Almost the thought of the picture of heaven where we're, where we're worshiping and we step out of the world that we're in, that we have to be in, and we come together in this place and, and we're, it's like heaven. And uh, then we leave, of course, and we go back out into the world to be your servants. And so we're strengthened and, and we're lifted up. But we're, we're thankful for this opportunity every chance we get. And Lord, as this special day in front of us unfolds, this congregational meeting this morning making it a different setting, we pray, God, that you would bless the work and, and that your hand would continue upon us. That's our prayer in this congregational meeting service, that the, the light, the city that you've set, on a hill to shine a light here in South Hello would, would continue. We pray for that. We pray that our labor would uh, be blessed and you would be at work through us. We, we've seen you at work. We pray you'll continue to be at work. And uh, Lord, for your glory, we pray. Until Jesus comes, and that's, that's what we look forward to. So bless as we come into your st study of your word now and we get a picture of the churches of Christ and, and what it looks like and, and how Jesus in the midst and doing his work and it gives us the right perspective and the right focus. So bless it. And then, Lord, even as we gather together and worship as the church, we know that there are different needs that are represented, and to be able to pray for each other. We're thankful for that opportunity. Our Sunday School Hour, we did that, but just in this gathering here, as we, as we worship in spirit and truth, we pray, God, that you'll be at work in every heart, every need, every life that is represented, Lord, as your people. May, may the Whatever's going on, whatever that next step is, whatever, all oh, the multitude of things coming and going in our lives, may it be according to you, God, and your work, be it in the center of it all, your work, your hand. And so we pray for the doctor's visits, test results, even recoveries, and uh, strength that's needed, help for decisions, and, and Lord, all of these things. Thank you for being at work in our lives, in every situation of our lives. So bless, we pray, as we pray for each other here in this moment and in our time of worship. And may we be able to rejoice in you. May we be able to hear. May we be able to celebrate together your goodness as we've trusted you and called upon you in our time of need. And we already pray that you'll bless the work, but we pray for our missionaries as well and their work that continues in the year ahead and how many years you give us. And uh, we pray that the gospel, the Hendricks this week and our other missionaries, we pray the gospel would have free course and be glorified all around the world. For the law, you continue to build your church, God, as you save the lost. We pray for that. Thank you now for your word and, and, the, and the focus and the perspective it gives us as the church. We pray that you'll bless now as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So young people, you're dismissed to your time downstairs. 
and we will send someone down to let you know when the meeting starts after we study God's Word. And so we'll, we'll bring everybody back up at the close for the meeting. And, uh, and uh, they'll study God's Word in the meantime, have their Bible time. Let's take our Bibles to Romans 16 now. Romans 16 now this morning. We've been talking about it, and we're heading in this direction. This is where our time in God's Word is going to be in Romans 16. Just wonderful. I, I, I love this, to, to, to emphasize this when I see it. It's just wonderful how God orchestrates His work in our midst. I mean, studying passages like I do, God leads. And I know God's at work in hearts and divisions. I can't figure all that out. God does. But then, in the in a bigger picture of the of the circumstances that come around our worship together, and how God works those things out according to His perfect plan, Romans sixteen, chapter sixteen, verses one through twenty-seven. Paul's closing his letter by bringing to our attention all the different people and all the different churches that were around him. It's just a neat perspective from God's word this morning as we come together as the people of God here in our church, and our fellowship, and have a congregation, a, congreg a, a, a gathering together meeting, and there's this perspective before us in Romans 16 of all the different churches around Paul and all the different people in all the different churches around Paul. See, see, here's, here's the idea. This is, it's a biblical picture that Paul gives us in a couple different places. It was never about Paul. It was never about Apollos. It was never about Cephas as he goes by or Peter. It's always about Jesus building his church and doing his work in the midst of his people. There are always other people. There are always other uh, uh, servants. And so this is a beautiful picture as we close the book of Romans. It would have just been a, a nice thought to, to, to remind us that that the work is bigger than Paul. There are so many other people that have a part to play. And we, we're going to take some wonderful truths from it. But I love the way God orchestrated it. That as we come together in our congregational meeting, we're all reminded that there's this great work that God is doing. And his people all have a part to play. Wherever, whoever they are, whatever part they have. Paul closes his letter by bringing to our attention all the people that were involved in God's work around him. All the people and all the churches that he was, he was a part of. Some of these people we never hear of except for this one note in the scriptures. But God knew who they were. And their role was important. Yes, Paul had a great work to do. And there were many around him that did their part faithfully to the glory of God. So that's the picture that God gives us of his church here in Romans 16. We are one body with many members. We all have a role to play in God's work. Would my name be listed as a faithful servant in the work of the Lord? Will, will we be faithful to do our part right here where we are, just like Paul and the other churches? Will we be faithful? Will our name be listed as a faithful servant? Will we be faithful to do our part where God has put us? And then at the end, of course, as we've been emphasizing, the, the whole purpose, the whole foundation, Paul says, now to God, to him, the only wise God, be glory forever and ever. So let's learn some lessons from these closing verses about faithful service in the churches of Christ, leading right up to our congregational meeting. Three main thoughts, you'll see them as we go through it. Number one, faithful servants. What are some of the lessons we learned from these closing verses? First of all, we have faithful servants. In verses 1 through 16, we're going to read them together in just a minute. Paul mentions 29 different people in the first 16 verses. 29 different people. He mentions six groups of saints or brethren or churches. And we don't even know how many were in those. 29 different people, six groups of saints, brethren, churches, fellowships of God's people. Right, just reading these verses gives us a wonderful picture of the churches. The churches of Christ. You'll see that phrase when we read it. And all the people involved in serving the Lord. Look at verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church which is at Centria, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of. For she hath been a succorer, a helper, a supporter of many, and of myself also. 
Greet Priscilla and Aquila. We've heard of them before. My helpers in Christ Jesus who have laid down for my life, laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Athenaeus, who is the firstfruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Grant and greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Asterobolus' household. Salute Herodion, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa. Interesting, those two names. They sound so much familiar. Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia, Nereos and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with an holy kiss, the churches of Christ. Salute you. I mean, just reading through it gives you this picture, this view of all of these people that were involved in Paul's life. And at the end there, verse 16, is where we get that phrase, the churches of Christ. That's what brings it. What is it that brings us together in our fellowship and in our desire to, 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 to be together and to serve together? What is it? It's the churches of Christ. The common bond of all of these people, are you with me, is the church of Christ. We don't know much about these people, but we do know that they were God's people, the children of God, in the family of God. Each of them were saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, who died on a cross to save us from our sin, rose again to bring victory over death. God saves us and puts us into the body of Christ. We don't know much about these people, but we know that they were, first of all, the children of God, the people of God. We also know, secondly, that they were faithfully serving God. What does Paul say throughout this whole first 16 verses? What does he say? Greet them, greet them, help them, encourage them. Look at what so-and-so is doing. Look at what so-and-so has done. They were faithfully serving God in the work that God gave them to do, and God saw them. God, through Paul, commends them and acknowledges them and encourages them. So that's what we're supposed to hear this morning. Little old church in South Hill, Pennsylvania that's in the middle of nowhere. What, what, what does God see as his people? You've got to be saved. Number one, that's the only reason you're a part of the church of Christ. Not because we're some social club and everybody just, it's a social thing, and a community thing. We've got to all come to church on Sunday morning. No, because we're the people of God. So number one, you've got to be saved. And then number two, you have to be that, okay, God, thank you for bringing me into your body. How can we serve God together? What, what does God see as we serve God together in, in our lives? You see us faithfully serving God. There's a couple lessons, and it's not going to take long. It's, it's the whole point of this this morning is just to be encouraged. The first thought is the faithful servants that God sees and, and God acknowledges them. What are, where are we at in our fellowship as we faithfully serve the Lord? Number one, just notice they're called servants. Verses 1 and 2, what does it say in verse 1? It says a servant of the church, and then it says that she has succored many. She's helped, supported many, many. Phoebe was a servant. That word servant, that's the key word. She helped. The word suckered means she supported. Even Paul, it says. She helped many to stand and to carry out God's work as she did her part. I want you to notice verse 3. What's, what does verse 3 say? Greek, Priscilla, and Aquila, my what? Helpers. Look at verse 9. What does verse 9 say? Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. So, number one, we have this word, servant. The people of God, the churches of God, Christ, have in it servants. Um, Paul was a leader. He was an apostle. 
So he had a title. We're not going to ignore that. They're not all were called to be apostles. He says that. But even the apostles are called to be servants. We're all called to be servants. So number one, what can we take from this group of people in the churches of Christ pictured in the scriptures around Paul? There were a bunch of servants. Was Phoebe housing the apostles when they came through? Was she cooking meals for people? Was she organizing different ministries in the church? Some have said she was the one who carried Paul's letter to Rome. That's why he asked them to help her, because she's there on, on the business. So we're all servants. We're all helpers. Every Christian is a servant. We are serve the Lord Christ, Ephesians says. Okay, that's the first thing we want to take from this faithful Servants picture of all the church of Christ. Number two, sacrifice. Did you see that in verse three? Greek son of Quilla, my helpers in Christ. Verse four, Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Quilla and Priscilla put their lives on the line. You get the idea of laying down your neck. That's what they did when they were going to cut a person's head off. They put their neck on the chopping block. They were willing to pay the price. They did not draw back when it was dangerous. So first of all, a picture of the churches of Christ is a picture of servants. Secondly, a picture of the churches of Christ is a picture of sacrifice. Not all of us are going to be called to lay down our lives, to put our lives at risk for the work of God. But we must be willing. That, Aquila and Priscilla didn't die, but they laid down their lives for Paul. They laid down their own necks. They were willing to to give their lives for the cause of Christ. They counted the cost, right? That's what Jesus says. They counted the cost. Uh, verse 7, Paul lists two others who were what? Look at verse 7. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles. So not only Paul in jail, but others of God's people were in jail. Fellow prisoners with Paul, maybe in the same jail, but clearly he's saying at least they were prisoners just like he was because serving Jesus looks like being willing to give our all for me. the church cannot be just serving God when you know everybody's for it and, and the culture accepts it. No, the church through the years, ages and, and on into the future until Jesus comes must be willing to sacrifice. That's how the work's going to get done. We're servants there's sacrifice. Number three there's labor. Look at verse 6. What's this word in verse 6? Greet Mary who bestowed much labor on us. Serving God takes work. It takes effort. All of us in this room know that because the ministries that we've had don't just happen. I think one that clearly comes to my mind uh, in our fellowship as the pastor, one that clearly comes to my mind is the opportunity to minister to families in the death of a loved one. Funeral. Those don't just happen. We all know that here. It takes work. And the ministry of God to that family through the church, through the, the church of Christ here, takes work, labor. And that's exactly what God's called us to do. We, 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 our labor's not in vain in the Lord. We must be willing to bestow, what does it say in verse 6? Much labor for the cause of Jesus. So many hands make light work. When we're all serving and laboring together, it definitely makes it uh, lighter and enjoyable. When it's just one or two in a group of God's people that are willing to labor and the others aren't willing to labor, that makes it difficult. So here's the picture of the churches of Christ. Labor. There was work. Keep working. Keep laboring. Look at verse 12. What does it say in verse 12? Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa who labor in the Lord. The word comes up again in verse 12. So there is labor. Let's have this attitude of working hard and laboring for the Lord. Not quitting. But it was to say, um, it's in Romans earlier, 14. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Number four, this picture. We're just getting some pictures of what the faithful service looks like. Servants, it looks like being a servant, it looks like sacrifice, it looks like labor, and then it looks like affection in verse 16. That final verse that he kind of sums it all up. Salute one another with a holy kiss. 
The bond and unity of the Spirit gives us an affection and love for each other in the body of Christ. Think about how many friends Paul had in the Lord. Friends in the Lord. That's why he greets all these believers. Because they were, they were part of his, they were part of his, his uh, heart. That's why Paul greets all these believers. Because there was a common affection for each other. We're glad to be in each other's company. We look forward to fellowship together. You know, we've talked about this before, this whole idea of uh, greeting one another with a holy kiss. Eastern culture does things different than the Western culture. So today it would look like a firm handshake where you're just glad to see you because we have a connection in the Lord. There's this, there's this common joy in the Lord. Um, Demas, Paul gives this sad testimony. Demas hath left me, hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And that breaks that, that wonderful bond of, of fellowship in the Lord. The world, the flesh, it's a shame when that bond of affection is broken because of sin. Paul knew it, but he says to these people, greet one another with a holy kiss. The, the, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, that's what Paul's pointing us to here. Faithful servants, all right? So Paul's closing his letter. He's thinking of the church. He says, praise the Lord. Look at all the faithful servants. Look at all those that are around me doing God's work. And, and praise the Lord for them and help them. And let's keep serving the Lord. Number two, he points out faithful service. Paul next encourages the church to remain faithful in their service to God. It's interesting how Paul does this. He, he greets the believers, and then he gives two final words of instruction. Well, one final word of instruction and one word of encouragement. Here's the instruction. Number one, verses 17 through 19, identifying dividers. Verse 17, now I beseech you, brethren, mark. The word there, mark, means to point them out. Make them known. Set them apart. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, the truth in Christ. Avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Here's his encouragement in the light of this, is this exhortation. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf for your obedience. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. So don't let them in. Don't let them divide you. Don't let false teachers in your midst pull you apart from, what does it say in verse 17? The doctrine which you have learned. I, I find this interesting. Verse 16, Paul just encouraged us to greet one another affectionately and joyfully. And then he turns right around in verse 17 and tells us to mark and identify and resist those who would divide the body of Christ. I find that interesting. Because here's what's next in my notes. The false teaching today that the church should love and accept everyone no matter what they do or say is dealt with here. I mean, it's our culture today. You're supposed to love everybody. Everybody should feel comfortable. You're not allowed to say anybody's wrong. Everybody should. And so in the church, everybody should just have their own opinion and nobody's going to point anything out. And we have to be so shallow with the scriptures because we don't want to offend anybody. A faithful church will not allow false teachers to divide God's people. A faithful church will deal with those that cause division contrary to the doctrine that we have heard and learned according to the scripture. A faithful church will deal with those that cause division because of sin and selfishness and the world and pride and envy. It is interesting that Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And then he turns around and says, mark those that don't want to be a part of what God's doing. <laughs> we, we have to keep this balance. We have to. We have to keep the balance of, of loving and rejoicing together. And, and what does the Bible say? Long-suffering and, and just, amen, we're going to keep growing together and helping each other. And then we have to be able to say, this is what the Bible says this is where we stand, and because of sin, the world, self, envy, whatever, pride, we have to be able to say, the church will head in this direction, and you're welcome to join us if you're submit and surrender to God. But if not, then you're not going to be allowed to cause division. 
We must be able to keep that balance. We must, what's the main thought? Keep our eyes on Jesus, right? The doctrine. We must all be walking according to God's truth. False teachers, Paul warned this, and we're not going to get into this much. Paul warned the church, though, that false teachers would be coming in their midst. He, he, Jesus warned us about it. And that's what verse 18, they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of many. Jesus warned us. Paul warns us. We don't want to be deceived. We, want, we must point out what's wrong and avoid it. And so that's verse 19. I'm grateful for your obedience. I love how you've been doing what's right. So be ignorant toward the evil and be wise toward that which is good. That's what it says at the end of verse 19. Don't let false teaching come in and pull you away from what's good and right. Be ignorant toward that in the sense of don't even, don't even let it be a part of your ministry or your fellowship. Keep it at bay. So faithful discipline and marking those that hinder God's work will keep the church faithfully serving. Here's the second thing Paul says. It's, it's, a, it's an encouragement. Verses 20 through 24, standing in grace. Look at verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. He talks about Timothy, Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, my kids, when they salute the churches, who wrote it, Gaius. He talks about it, Erastus, Cordus. Look at verse 24 again. So verse 20 the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Here's a couple more people that want to say hi. Verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So, so I'm finding it interesting in these verses right here. He uses, he gives that phrase, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He uses it twice. Because he knows, listen, Paul knows that the churches of Christ are on the battlefield. He knows that we're in a battle. Who's our greatest enemy? Verse 20. Who is the greatest enemy of the church? Satan. And Paul knows that we're there. So he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Verse 20. Verse 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And he says, amen, at the end of both of those. Verily, truly, the grace of our Lord. Satan is our greatest enemy, but God will defeat him in due time. That's what Paul encourages us with in verse 20. God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. That's the issue. The issue in the world is Satan's work to destroy what God is doing. The issue in the world is be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking who may devour. The issue is not the people around us, you know, our culture. The issue is this, this prince of the power of the darkness of the, of the air, of, of the... the the things that are against God. The issue is our enemy, Satan. And so Paul mentions God's grace twice on purpose in this light because we need God's grace while we fight against our enemy. God's going to bruise them under our feet. God's going to crush them. But in the meantime, God's grace is sufficient. We can be encouraged today by God's grace as we wait for God to crush Satan under our feet. Let's fight the good fight of faith, knowing that the victory is ours. Satan will not stand. He will be crushed. Part of the, you can hear what Paul's saying here, right? Part of the temptation is to be discouraged. Discouragement hindering our service. So faithful service looks like dealing with those that would divide God's work and hinder God's people and walking in the truth. And faithful service looks like standing in grace because our enemy is there, but God will defeat him. God encourages us by reminding us that Satan will be defeated someday. So let's press on in faithful service because we know that Satan will be crushed under our feet. The picture we're getting in these closing verses, and, and it applies perfectly in our situation in our fellowship here today, is a faithful servant, faithful service, and now we end with faithful worship, which is the foundation of the church. The reason for our service, if you will. Verse 25. Now, you just see this, right? And he does this in other letters. It, under inspiration, God always takes us back now to him, right? I mean, his, all right, Paul's written this long letter, and, and he's got, he had some great things to say under inspiration. But when it all said and done, what does he say? Now to him. 
that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the, of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known. So according to all that God said he would do that now you've heard about through the scriptures, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only, to him, verse 25, it's God only wise. Be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Everything comes back to God, doesn't it? He's the reason for the church. He's the reason for our service. Paul's concluding word of worship in the book of Romans brings us back to the one who designed the whole plan of, of salvation, the whole gospel. Verse 25, to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. It's God who establishes his people in Christ. Right? You guys follow? It's God who establishes his people. That's what he says in verse 25. To him there is power to establish you. To establish you. It was God's plan from the beginning of time. Verse 25. According to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. That God would send Christ to bring into his fellowship those who would believe. And now, verse 26. That good news is made known to all nations for the salvation of all who will believe. Verse 26, now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith, of course, is the obedience and surrender that I need Christ. I'm repenting and turning in faith to Jesus. I'm obeying God and accepting Christ. So this, this power, who's able to establish us, to him who's able to establish us by his power, through the gospel that he planned from the beginning, that, that Christ would come and, and die on a cross to save us from our sin, but now is made known through the preaching of the prophets and, and, and the word of God. All of this comes to us and says, to God only wise, verse 27. To God only wise. Now, that just makes sense, doesn't it? Because he's the one who planned the whole purpose of our salvation. The whole, the whole plan of salvation is from God. The only wise God, to God only wise, be glory. The word glory is, is the idea of, of heaviness, of gra uh, greatness. Uh, what was the song that we sang? Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. That's the idea of glory. Only God gets the glory. So think about it in the churches of Christ, right? That's what we're talking about this morning. There's faithful servants. There are faithful servants, and there's faithful service. But at the end of the day, there's faithful worship because God is the, the, the center, the heartbeat. Only God gets the glory, not Paul, not all of the people that he mentioned, right? <laughs> Only God. What a perfect and wonderful ending to this chapter that says... <coughs> Thank you for your service. Greet all these wonderful laborers in the Lord. And keep your eyes on God. Don't let division come. Don't let Satan hinder you. Keep your, what a wonderful conclusion to this chapter that points out how God's at work. And he says, now to him. The wonderful salvation that we have through God who gets the glory as we continue to faithfully serve him every day. At the end of the day, the church is about the glory of God. To him be glory through Jesus Christ forever. And that's why we say amen. That's where that word amen, as I said in our, in our singing time, we're just, we're just having another opportunity to say amen to what God is doing, to who God is in our lives. Amen. So this morning, as we move into our congregational meeting, this, this picture, I think it's just a wonderful opportunity to rejoice in how God's plan is being carried out in his church. We're part of God's, of the church of Christ. That, the churches of Christ, we're part of, of the church of Christ. Our work here. Now think about it. Our work here is part of God's work. That Paul said that to all these people. Help them. And they're doing this. And this person doing this. And this person doing this. Because we're all a part of God's work. So let's continue to be faithful servants. Let's continue to have faithful service. And not let anything hinder us and, 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 and pull us apart. And number three, let's always continue in faithful worship. Because at the end of the day, that's what the church is going to be doing in heaven. Worshiping God to Him. 
the God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this passage and how it fits into where we are. <laughs> I'm thankful that you're doing that all the time in our lives. The word, the, 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 the word of God is quick and powerful. And you come to us right where we are in our walk with you. Tomorrow, the word of God right in our time with you, and it'll be you speaking to us. But thank you for, as a group, as the, as the, as the congregation, as the corporate body of Christ, thank you for coming to us in this time. Just how it all came together for your work in our midst. And how you're speaking right to us here. We're not any of those people mentioned that Paul talked about. But we are your people right here in South Hillam. And we want to be those faithful servants. And continue that faithful service. And we want to continue to worship you, God. To him be all glory. So help us as we have our meeting now. Help us as we continue to serve. Through whatever comes and goes, Lord. May you keep us. May you keep us focused on you, God. On Jesus. And may we stay grounded in the truth so that at the end, we truly do bring glory to you. People don't see us. They see you, God. They see Jesus. And we're able to say amen because of how great you are. Thank you for this time. Now bless our meeting, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.